Jeff Swearingen. Here. Patrick Updike. Present on the phone. David Anderson. Here. Marty Smith. He's not going to be here. Tom Lampy. Present. John Benson. Jeff Franklin. Present. Andy Buffington. Present on the phone. Ellen Hagen. Present. Michelle Bischoff. Present. David Ness. Here. Jason Leonard. Here. Rob Rotter. Here. Michael Casper. Carol Lund Smith. Here. Larry Smith. Here. And Angela Clouser. We do have a quorum. Okay, thank you. If I could do the introduction of board members with those on the phone first, please. Patrick Updike, Iowa Department of Corrections. Andy Buffington, Winnebago and Hancock County Emergency Management and Communications. Is that it? Start down. Carol Lund Smith, Iowa Law Enforcement Academy. Larry Smith, Keka County Emergency Management. Dave Ness, Municipal Police from Des Moines. Jason Leonard, Waverly Police Department, Municipal Police. Tom Lampy, DPS. Chris Myers on the SWIC. Angel Clouser, Panorama Schools. Jeff Franklin, State CIO. Ellen Hagen, Jewel Fire and Rescue, representing volunteer firefighters. Rob Rotter, Iowa County Sheriff. Michelle Bischoff, Des Moines Fire, representing professional chiefs. Hey. Okay, that should cover it. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm looking for the approval of today's agenda. If I could get a motion for that, please. So moved. Michelle? Uh, I'd like to make an amendment to okay. the agenda. We need to add... Um, an amendment to the um, funding for the forum. We were a hair off, and the finance committee approved that. So we'd like to have that in the agenda to add, today. You want to add it to new business? That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. I have a motion that, uh, and an amendment. Do I have a second? Second. Give a second. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Approval of the meeting minutes from April 11th, 2019. A motion for that, please. Larry Smith. Second. Second. Angela. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Swick report. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, quick update on some things that are kind of outstanding. Uh, our encryption paper that we submitted to the P25 uh, user needs subcommittee uh, many months ago uh, will probably be on the agenda for the meetings in June, which are going to be here in Des Moines. Uh, if you remember, we made uh, three key recommendations that we would like to see happen in the uh, with respect to the encrypted uh, subscriber units and management of encryption keys. Uh, those will be up for debate again, and it's possible that they uh, uh, may get assigned to a work group uh, following those meetings, so we'll see how those go. Uh, we've had some initial scoping calls with uh, FPIC, uh, the Federal Partnership for Interoperable Communications, to look at uh, what's going to happen with that and, and, and what we need to do for legwork on that. Uh, just uh, I just returned from the uh, SAFECOM and NICSWIC uh, joint meetings in Pittsburgh two weeks ago. Uh, some very good presentations were presented on interoperability in, in, in other states, and I can, again, relay that we're doing a lot of things very, very well with the way we uh, handle governance and our structure and our processes. Uh, one 
piece of information I do want to pass on to the board here. Uh, this is primarily a law enforcement related item, but for those agencies and departments that have decided to use static en encryption keys from NLEC, the National Law Enforcement uh, Emergency Com or the National Law Enforcement uh, Communication Center, um, there is enough credible evidence now to believe that those static keys have been compromised. So if you're using any encryption key material associated with uh, some of the SLNs like five and six or some of the other static keys that you would get from NLEC, uh, consider those compromised. Uh, this is based on actionable evidence from federal law enforcement. I'm not sure what that evidence is, and I'm not sure what their definition of a compromised key consists of. They haven't been necessarily forthcoming with that. However, there will be an initiative that will be launched soon to get those keys updated. So for those law enforcement agencies that are using those keys, uh, be ready for uh, some sort of mechanism or process coming up down the road for updating them. Um, Moving on to things a little bit closer to home, uh, I have an update on status board. We have a draft, a joint powers agreement that has been delivered to us from the state of Minnesota for the passing on of that source code to us. Um, gave it a couple initial uh, read-throughs. <clears throat> things look to be okay for the most part. Uh, we passed it on to the governance committee to look at as well. Um, I'll let uh, uh, John or, or, or Dave report out on that. But we are going to send that to the attorney general's office for review just since it involves signing a legal document. It's always good to have that, that blessing from the AG's office to, to do that. A uh, quick update on some interstate interoperability uh, efforts. Uh, meetings are happening routinely now with all of our neighboring states. Uh, brief uh, synopsis of updates. Uh, the next meeting we have with Minnesota will be in July. We just had one uh, in April that went very, very well. Uh, we're starting to get down into uh, brass tax policy of uh, what 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 are some things like pursuits going to look like going forward between our two states. And I'm expecting that we'll discuss that uh, fairly uh, in depth uh, in our July meeting. Uh, we have some draft uh, documents in place with Illinois. Those are also uh, going to the AG's office for the official blessing. Uh, the governance committee has also seen them. Uh, our next meeting with Nebraska will probably be postponed. So for our Western Iowa states, our Western uh, Iowa counties, uh, that meeting will be postponed. It was scheduled to be on the Nebraska side of the river, but there's some questions with venues that they're working on sorting out. Uh, South Dakota and Missouri, uh, we had some very productive meetings with them as well. Uh, basically, at this point, if we give them a letter stating what, what we're going to do from our end, such as allowing their peace apps to connect, and if they want to bring on <laughs> subscriber units for interoperability, uh, we're willing to do that. If we give them a letter, then they will reciprocate similar letters. So we'll probably uh, move that to our various committees to get those letters drafted and approved and then up to the board for uh, final approval. I uh, have an update on that uh, standard from last month with TR8 uh, regarding uh, measuring uh, digital antenna characteristics. Uh, I did vote yes on that after some review. I thought it was a, a, a good standard to get established so that uh, baselines for measurements so that they're consistent across all, all of the industry. Uh, getting them on the book sooner as opposed to later would be beneficial. Uh, that's my report uh, for this meeting, and I'll take questions. Chris, did you... Did you, uh, when you're talking about the compromised keys, yeah. do you know how, what's the mechanism of getting a hold of those agencies here in Iowa? Do you know anything about that? I don't. I, I, I don't have any information on if any agencies in Iowa are even using them, but uh, my thought was that there's enough law enforcement in Iowa that someone somewhere may be uh, using them. So I thought this would be a good avenue to get that information disseminated or at least start the process of it. Um, the, the benefit of using a static key in the past was thought that, well, it's a secure key, it's AES-256, you know, it's not going to change, so we don't have to worry about managing the update cycles or anything like that. But uh, this kind of changes things a little bit with that. Uh, but as far as who has them, I, 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 I don't have any good data at this point. For the neighboring states interoperability agreements, is there going to be an agreement with each state, or do you have one agreement, or I shouldn't say agreement? policy is there a policy for each state or do we have a policy for all states and then have agreements attached so the way we're looking at this or, or at least kind of the way i've envisioned it is is there's really two stages to this there's there's the acknowledgement stage from both sides saying yes this is something we think is a good idea yes this is something we want to do we agree with the concept of of, of joining neighboring states as uh, lmr networks for interoperability uh, different states want those agreements in place differently. Minnesota 
and uh, Missouri and South Dakota do things differently than, say, Illinois or Wisconsin or Nebraska. So on the initial agreement stage, that'll be slightly different. But down the road, once those agreements are in place, when we start looking at our policies and standards, that will probably be the same regardless of whether we're dealing with Wisconsin or Minnesota or Missouri or Illinois or so on and so forth. So the initial agreement, there'll be some variance in how that gets done. But once we get into the policies and standards, that'll be pretty uniform. At least that's the way it's looking right now. Okay. Chris, if you write something up and send it to me, I will send it out to my outreach people right. to will do. be Thank sent you. on. All right, we'll move on to uh, the 911 council report. Blake. <clears throat> Good morning, board. Just two things for you today. Uh, first is actually really exciting, though. Uh, Jefferson County PSAP was turned up on the shared services uh, last month. Uh, so that's the first one that is connected to the, uh, the dual permanent hosts. We had Han Hancock County up and running as the proof of concept. That was kind of a one-off. Uh, but Han or Jefferson County is now up and running. Powashik, is, Powashik County is scheduled for next week. Uh, so starting to go a little quicker here at this point. Uh, and we have 33 at this point um, PSAPs that have uh, submitted their non-binding notice of interests. Uh, secondly, House File 516 was signed. This is more for local uh, attention. Uh, this adds the uh, sheriff and the police chief of a PSAP, if it is a city-owned and operated PSAP, to the local 911 service board. Uh, so that still includes the regular political subdivisions. Nobody is lo uh, losing a vote. It just adds uh, a couple uh, different uh, components to the local 911 service boards. Any questions? Thanks. Who's your group committee? Uh, Chair Buffington, are you still with us? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, user group committee had two meetings last month. Um, at first meeting, we approved... Um, I believe four um, new, well, three new applications and one update. Um, we needed uh, um, some loading analysis done um, for a few more. Um, so we had a second meeting to, uh, to consider those. Um, and those will be uh, in the new business, the six, um, the six updates or the six new applications to consider. Also, one of the things that became extremely apparent is the need to refine the process um, again on the application. So I've drafted a form. Um, I've sent it to the chair and the SWIC and to Mr. Mercado from Motorola that basically goes through and it's a signatory page for all the new applications moving forward so that each step in the process we're able to um, go in um, once it moves past, you know, once the letter of intent is um, is is delivered, once the memorandum of agreement is is signed. Um, by both entities that form is going to just accompany these applications throughout the process included in that is going to be a um a provision that um, before the applicant participation plan gets to the user group committee level um, we're going to um, put it in motorola's um, inbox so that they have a chance um, to to review it do the loading analysis if it needs more technical and engineering um, study then they can get in um, they can get with the applicant, uh, do that deeper dig, and render an opinion prior to the user group committee um, just talking about it on the phone. Um, so I think right now I tentatively have said that they have 30 days to, to do that. Um, obviously, um, I need to have a conversation with the folks at Motorola to make sure that that's ample time so that they can get it done um, effectively. Uh, and we're, we're kind of taking the position that if after whatever agreed to time limit, um, after that expires without any um, type of um, approval or loading analysis done, um, that would essentially almost um, imply consent from the vendor that it wouldn't be a loading issue. Um, so we're just going to really drop it into their, um, into their court so that one of the things we can do is that when we're on these calls, they're not taking um, an hour and a half, two hours discussing individual applications um, because that legwork needs to get done beforehand. That's not something we've done before, but we need to continue to refine the process. And uh, that's how I think is going to be the best way to move forward with that. 
So with that, that ends my report. Is there any questions? Andy, this is Dave. I've got a question for you or the SWIC or the chair. I just wonder if you could elaborate a little bit about uh, Motorola's role in this. I heard some uh, criticism and it was not directed at the user group committee, but I think it was from some people that uh, may not fully understand. And uh, the uh, implication was that the user group committee wanted to approve and Motorola was saying no. And I'd just like you to explain why we're consulting a Motorola, what the role is there as the technical advisor, the designer of the system. It makes sense to me, but in case there are people watching today, uh, if you could elaborate a bit on that. Well, I, I can start, and I'm sure that the chair and the SWIC would be happy to, uh, to elaborate further, but obviously the user group committee is that um, it is our understanding that we want to find ways to say yes. Um, also, um, we have to keep system integrity is, is paramount, you know. Um, that, that's always been things that we talk about during those meetings. With that as well, um, yeah, Motorola is the one that is going to, to have to be the one to run the loading analysis to make sure that um, as these applicants come on, they bring their talk groups, they bring their radios, that it's not going to have an adverse effect um, on the system. Um, so that's essentially why we we have to go back to the vendor and ask. I, just, I don't think we have the capabilities, or at least not right now, um, with staff to be able to sit down and say that loading would or would not be a problem. That way we uh, we put it to Motorola. If they say it's okay, then they're they're essentially ensuring us that um, the system and its uh, its capabilities, um, everything will be running just fine. And I'm sure the, the chair or the SWIC would, uh, would love to uh, elaborate further. I don't think it matters what kind of system it is. Any system you have, you have to look at that stuff and it goes down to the users, uh, the number of times they're, or how long they're gonna be on, the number of radios, it's all, it's all about math, right? Uh, so when any vendor, any company designs a system, you have to take into account the number of radios, the number of channels available, all that stuff. Um, I think part of the problem you had the other day, and I wasn't on the call, but from what I'm hearing is, and Andy's already fixed it, uh, by, by identifying a new process uh, so it doesn't tie up the phone because the people on the phone, I assume the UGC committee members wouldn't take, wouldn't want the responsibility. They're not engineers. Um, we have to go with our vendor that is building the system and have, we have to take the word that it, it will either harm it or it will not. So I don't know what else, um, I'm comfortable with that process. Um, I agree with you on the loading analysis, Andy. Uh, it, like I said, it does not matter what system you have, this is, will be done, and we could probably get you good examples of systems all over the country that would probably look at it at the same way and from an engineering aspect. You have to protect the kingdom, you have to protect it, so everybody gets a beep and doesn't get a bonk. It's as simple as I can That's my point. Go ahead if you want to add to that. Yeah, um, as far as some specifics of things that they're actually looking for, um, a lot of it focuses on the number of radios and especially the number of talk groups and what discipline those talk groups are going to be assigned to. Some disciplines use more resources than others. So so doing that math and statistical analysis to maintain what, what, what they look at as a greatest service, which is kind of the metric that, that says, you know, directly – you have a very, very high probability of getting a beep as opposed to a bonk with the way the system is set up here with these users on the system with their talk groups. Uh, so a lot of things are factored in. Who's using the talk group? How many talk groups? How many radios? Uh, even getting down to something like how long is the average push to talk? Um, basically the number of active units at any one time that may be using that talk group. There's a lot of things they look at and, uh, there's some well-established math that helps them figure all, all that out. So, uh, that'll like chair Buffington said, uh, we'll figure out a way to incorporate that in, into the process more efficiently and effectively so that we're not uh, spending an excessive amount of time on the phone, looking at something that could be analyzed before those calls start. And, and, and also there is some common sense involved here. Um, you have to also you have people that are on the committee that have operational knowledge on how things work and what's what's practical. Um, if you have a couple, uh, you know, regardless of the number of radios, what's the how does how does it work on the really work on the street? What are the odds of something happening? All that I think it's a package. 
you're, you're going off uh, expertise that actually use the radio, have been in scenarios, have been where there's a bunch of police and bunch of fire. You look at those scenarios, you look at the engineers, and come up with a solution the best to get, like Andy said, we're, we're going to try to get you approved. We're not looking not to get you approved, regardless of what radio you bring. Right. Sounds good. Thank you. Are you finished, Andy? Do you? Yes, sir. I'm done. Okay. We'll move on to finance then. Tuesday's meeting, we discussed that our monthly expenditures during April for the Interoperable and Broadband Communication Fund were $4,952. The April ending balance was $185,430. The mon monthly expenditures during April for the Slick P 2.0 were $9,766. Of that amount, 7,813 were federal expenditures, and the remaining federal amount available from the grant is $95,540. Senate File 615 was passed by both chambers during the past legislative session. Senate File 615 currently has a statewide interoperable communications appropriation receiving $115,661 in fiscal year 2020. As of today, the governor has not signed this bill into law. And Swick Myers, would you please uh, speak on the additional 5,000 that we're requesting? Yes, uh, certainly. Thank you, Chair Hagan. Um, when we were doing the planning stages for the FirstNet Regional Forum, uh, initially, we had thought that I think the initial ask is $20,000 would be enough to cover the expenses to host that forum. Uh, some expenses were uncovered after the fact that uh, uh, necessitated access to more of those SLIG P funds to help uh, pay for the forum. Uh, as such, uh, the Finance Committee uh, debated and reviewed an ask of an extra $5,000 of, of SLIG P monies to be put towards the forum for expenditures. Um, we do have the money available in the Sleek P fund to do this, so that'll be on the agenda today under new business. And I think a lot of the extra funds revolve around helping attendees uh, with assistance in, in, in getting to the forum also so that they can attend and, and uh, participate. Thank you. Does the board have any questions regarding the activities or financial position of uh, our communication funds? What are the numbers that we got so far, Holly? For how many have registered? Yeah. 125 as of this morning. Okay. Good number. Yes. Okay. Very good. How many are staying overnight? What's that? How many are actually staying overnight? Um, there's quite a few. I think we're at about 65 maybe that okay. are staying over. All right. That's <laughs> creeping up on us quick here, isn't it? Mm hmm Okay. I think it was a 90 mile radius. Is that what it was? It was. 90 miles. If you were within 90, you didn't get. It was 60, I believe. 60? All right. Yeah. I know I'm just out of it. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, board. Thank you. All right, governance. Are you taking care of that, Dave? Yes, I believe uh, John had a uh, conflict today at a conference. Um, we met on uh, Monday the 6th. And reviewed, as uh, the SWIC explained, we did, gave a preliminary review of agreements with uh, Missouri, Minnesota, and Illinois, <coughs> all of which are uh, headed to the AG uh, before coming back to the committee. So, just very preliminary um, toward your uh, or to your question earlier, uh, Chair. The different uh, states have different types of agreements. So we may rely on MOU or MOA in Iowa. I think in uh, Minnesota, it's called a joint powers agreement. So ultimately, there will need to be a policy that governs, but the name of the agreement for every state may be different. Right. That's the end of my report, unless there are questions. Mr. Chair, this is Andy Buffington. Just for your information, I do have uh, Chair Benson um, with me right now. And Dave Ness did a fine job of reflecting what happened at the meeting. <laughs> Good to hear. All right, we'll move on to operations. Operations met on April 17th, and at that meeting, we provided feedback to technology regarding air to ground. Our recommendation is that they not be regionalized, that these 
uh, channels not be regionalized and they be assigned at a first come first served basis. We've also developed a consulate guide that is being polished for distribution with the consulates uh, that were grant funded. We um, are seeking a budget estimate for the FCC license management. That goes back a few meetings ago, but we're working on getting a, a better number for finance to be able to see if that's something we can finance or not. And uh, working with the LEA group and other, eight, and other legacy channels uh, for migration to ISIX. We're working on a proof of concept with LEA um, and the partnership there has been great. So we look forward to continuing to work through that. That ends my report unless there are questions. Michelle, I got a question on your, your comment on the air to ground, the first come, first serve. Uh -huh. Can you elaborate on that first come? Yeah, so we're recommending from operations that the reason, the, okay, so technology has put forth a plan that regionalizes all of the talk groups. And um, perhaps Chair Updike might chime in if I misspeak. The, um, where operations is recommending is that they not be regionalized because it's from operations perspective, these will be very low frequency use channels and um, to have them regionalized and have another burden to have to remember, oh, this is mine, just to have them be assigned top to bottom, just like all the other talk groups are, emergency go top, planned events from the bottom, um, that's our approach that it maintain the same uh, procedure as all of the other talk groups. Okay. That's that's our thought. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. The outreach. Well, we'd like to report that 125 registered for the forum May 29th and 30th, which we think is very good. And we're scheduling RIC 2 and 5 outreach. Uh, tentative RIC 2 is scheduled for June 25th. We're discussing FirstNet at interop, having interop booths at the State Fair. And on April 22nd, FirstNet AT&T meeting to plan the next six months of updates was held. And would you please submit to us any news that you have about your agency concerning <coughs> working toward interoperability or information that you'd like to be put in the newsletter. We appreciate your help. Any questions? That's right. my report. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're already queued up. Nice. <laughs> Thank you, Chair and Board. Um, so what we've been working on, uh, there's been some ISXB website updates. They've been minor. We're getting ready to do some security enhancements with web spec. Should be minor, should hardly notice. Um, thank you, Larry, as always. Larry caught some more things that um, could be updated. So we're going through and we're gonna probably start sending out the RIC updates and please review who is and who is not part of your RIC. Constant contact security. So with we used a tool called Constant Contact. We were notified by DPS IT that uh, we were seeing some spoofing events. Uh, I don't want to take too much away from Mr. Lundstedt because I'm sure he, he can much more elaborate on cybersecurity than I can. But uh, so if you receive emails from us concerning the newsletter, it will be from iowanet at dps.state.ia.us. Um, as we've been working through the DPS security requirements, it was agreed upon that that would be the email that we'll be sending out the newsletter. And that will be the email that if you reply back to the newsletter, it will be that email. Um, unless it's unless you are direct corresponding with someone from our team, that would be the only reason why you would receive those types of emails. So just for some clarification. Um, we had our Sleepy 2 grant submission. As far as I know, everything went fine with that. FirstNet updates from AT&T on standardizing. We submitted a, kind of a PowerPoint that they've used in the past and requested that um, maybe we work toward that being the consistent update so that we can post that using our newsletter. It's consistent when we present here. And AT&T said they would consider it. So that was really good. Uh, the ISIX website, uh, Swick Myers provided me, I provided him a list of everything that was in queue or currently on the ISIX website where it's in progress, approved, or online. Uh, Swick Myers went through it and I went through and updated that. So as far as approved, that should be updated. 
Um, as far as online, we're still kind of, you know, making sure that who, who's actually online and fully utilizing the system. That's the difference between approved. They may be using it, but they may not be fully using it yet. Um, with that, so it's 66 are what we have currently on the ISIX platform according to the website and they've gone through the process. This does not include all of the PSAPs. So as we've as you guys are going through the process of distributing the control stations or uh, whatever terminology you're using for control stations, each of those PSAPs would be become eventually approved as, as you've agreed upon, I believe in one of the previous uh, board meetings that all were given a blanket approval should they use their control station. And Ms. Bischoff, or Chair Bischoff, I owe her some survey uh, information for the operations committee, and uh, she reminded me that we needed to get that going, so uh, I sent her an email today saying um, I, I was just missing one last piece of information, and I'll be happy to execute that survey. And then, like uh, Chair Hagan said, uh, whatever information you have, please send it to me. If you have a, a comment about your agency and what you're doing to better interops, please let me know. Uh, or if you need more information, I know last time we had a little sidebar, uh, Larry, Ms. Bischoff, um, Ellen, and Mr. Ness and myself, and hopefully that they feel like I updated the newsletter to include the comments that they suggested. Beyond that, <coughs> any questions? All right, thank you. Move on to training. The uh, training committee met, and thank you very much, Swick Myers, for handling that in my absence. Uh, Swick Myers and Deputy Swick Walzer uh, were working on the commu planning and policies. That looks to be sometime the first week in August. The exact dates um, have not yet been set. Also, the PSAP cybersecurity webinar looks to be mid to late August. Again, not a certain date yet. Once I have that information, I'll be sure to update. Um, and we also need to obtain how many, uh, what the maximum number of people that can attend that webinar. Lastly, uh, COMT class in Clarinda at the fire department, looking at the last week in August, possibly for a date in that. And again, waiting to find out the exact dates and then we'll update. Any questions? I have one comment, uh, yes. Chair Lynn Smith. Um, I just got noticed today from Jim Lundstead with the PSAP cybersecurity webinar that the seating capacity is 100. Uh, of course, these are virtual seats. We do have the option to record it though. So we can uh, make sure that if someone cannot get in because there's not enough seating capacity for the virtual attendance, that they'll still have a mechanism to at least view it later on on demand. Uh, I don't know all the specifics of what it would take to record it and then make it on demand, but that's something we can look at also. And and, and in theory, if, if, if we could record it and in theory host it, it would be a nice way for PSAPs to kind of routinely train their personnel on the recognition or recognition of threats, mitigation of potential threats, and any action items that need to be taken whenever they do have a cyber uh, issue. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? Another comment. Boy, I like the idea of having it recorded because I, I sit down on those and go, what'd they say? <laughs> so if I can listen again, that would be very nice. Sure. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Technology. <clears throat> Patrick may have had to step off, so. Okay. Uh, I can cover that. He sent me a note before that he was gonna have to step off for a uh, uh, an issue with okay. uh, his uh, his uh, facilities. Um, so he did send me a, a draft report just in case. Uh, so at the last technology committee uh, meeting call, they had two the past um, uh, cycle. They had one on May 7th and then one on April 25th. Uh, they did look at the draft web text as it relates to uh, P25 cap testing and any resulting uh, subscriber lists that would be posted on the website. So there's a pretty good discussion on that. And, and from what I remember from my notes, it didn't seem like there was any hesitance necessarily to um, get that list ready to go for the website. So we'll at least have some guidance on there on what can work with subscribers. 
Um, there, there will be a responsibility of the agency and their vendors to make sure that they're getting the feature sets that are required because not all the feature sets that are required to have a radio that works with the system are uniformly named or uniformly packaged together. Uh, so there's still that to consider for the individual agencies. Um, on the 700 air to ground channel plan, they did modify it to a draft version 5.0. Uh, the reason they did that was assuming that there was ever some regional, regional use of these channels, uh, this would be the pathway to potentially cause the least amount of conflict with any channels that, that may be in use in, in local counties. The last thing that they want to have happen is uh, any of those air to ground channels cause uh, interference with local frequencies that may be in use on a daily basis. So there's some coordination with that, and uh, uh, Clint Miller did quite a bit of research on that. So thanks to him uh, for looking into that. Um, with uh, more on that, uh, there's only one channel uh, listed by the NIFOG as a landing zone channel. Uh, other channels could, could be made regional under policy or, or, or planning or licensing, but they did send that to the operations committee, and uh, Chair Bischoff commented on that earlier today. Uh, Patrick did look up uh, more uh, frequency coordinators potentially on licensing some of these channels. Uh, they do come with a price tag. Uh, APCO is a minimum of $100, uh, but they don't necessarily show any great details on what that $100 gets you or if that is the upper limit. Uh, so uh, they also looked at uh, IMSA, which is $60 per pair for licensing, and ASHTO, which is $55. Uh, there may be some costs that are on top of that. Uh, so figure, you know, baseline costs maybe somewhere around 800 bucks, maybe up over $1,000 in some cases. So over the next uh, couple of months, depending on what it looks like our costs may be, both with the licensing and any extraneous coordination costs, uh, Chair Updike plans to coordinate with the Finance Committee to ask for a maximum of $2,000 of budgetary money so that they can uh, get those uh, licensed. So if, uh, if it does also require this, they do also plan on coordinating with the 700 Regional Planning Committee for licensing of those channels in Iowa. Uh, that's just to make sure that everybody's on the same page with who's using what for frequencies so any potential for interference is minimized. So uh, Chair Updike plans to take the lead on that. Um, and then uh, on the final note with the 800 SOAs, uh, Chair Updike did submit an email to the 800 Regional Planning Committee uh, requesting assistance in requiring three new uh, 800 SOA channels for analog use. Uh, I believe this may require a modification of the 800 uh, megahertz plan for Iowa. So they are working on that with the 800 RPC. And then once we have that in place, it should make licensing them a lot easier because then we can say to the FCC, hey, these are in our plan. We're sticking to our plan. So let's get the licensing processes done. So uh, that is basically uh, Patrick's report. I don't think I left anything out, but uh, if I did, I will forward it on to the board uh, after the meeting is over today. All right, thank you. Broadband committee, you're back. I am. I have a very short report. We haven't met. Just due to the nature of the calendar, we meet next week. So okay. um, I have no updates, but I'll entertain any questions. And we've heard a lot about the forum. So I was just going to plug the forum, but it's been plugged plenty. Any questions? Appreciate it. Leah, committee. The Leah committee uh, pretty much concentrated in four different areas. One was consulates, the uh, working with the standards and operations committees statewide communication, and the co-location sites. As far as the consulates, they are being distributed right now. Training is being done, uh, and the PSAPs will also receive a, a thumb drive that will have all the documentation on that for them. Uh, we will be working with the Standards Committee to review the, the top group naming conventions and to set up some um, standards for setting up the consulates, using them, and turning them up on the system. So there's some consistency with that. Uh, we'll be working with the operations committee on naming conventions and make sure that we're following the naming conventions that, that they have right now. Uh, communication. Uh, Swick Myers is, will be talking to the RICs at their monthly meetings 
just so that we can provide some LEA updates so that they know what's going on. It can get out throughout the state. And lastly, the co-location work. This is the tower sites that have two different um, huts. What we're doing is tying those together so that we can get off of the old copper that's causing us so many challenges, that's no longer supported, use the new equipment. Not only is it going to remove some of the challenges we have with the uh, circuits going down, but it will also be a cost savings also. Are there any questions? Connie, I have one question. For those that PSAPs that aren't taking advantage of getting a consulate, will they be getting the thumb drive and the, the training information pushed out to them as well? It's my understanding that all of the PSAPs, with the exception of one uh, that was offered the consulates, are receiving those. And the one that is not receiving the consulate had already purchased one. Okay, I just want to make sure that that one or however many out there get the similar information. So uh, I'll, if I may. Thank you. Uh, it would be pretty simplistic to forward them the materials. They're all electronic format anyways, so that's just an email away, so that is certainly something we could do. I just want to make sure we're, we're spreading it out evenly. Anything else? I'll give the Thank vice you. chair opportunity if you want to chime in. Anything else on the LEA committee? Uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot, no. but... <laughs> Got to get turned on here. Um, one of the one of the conversations we had, and it it's um, kind of a complicated one, but not really either. Uh, a lot of times, these these types of things are really how how it's brought out to the the locals, maybe how it's sold. And one of my my issues that we that we talked about was, will people feel like we're taking something away? And where that plays into it is what do you call this next generation of communication? And there was the debate, and we talked about the naming, mm -hmm. uh, as to whether or not we refer to this as like the new LEA, which the advantage to that is people out in the rural areas will say, oh, they gave us a new LEA versus they took away our LEA. Then obviously we run into issues with the, the the style of naming we're not following our our standard and so that was one of the struggles we kind of worked on for a while and i i think what's going to probably end up happening is we're probably going to follow the the right naming style here and um and abandon the the name lea so i think that's part of the thing that we're going to have to do as we bring this forward with these these uh the, these these new frequencies that we're using that we have to make them understand that this is a replacement that we're we're not intending to take anything away from somebody we're we're trying to give them something else to use now and we just have to make sure that that is clear throughout the state because there there will be people if we don't do that that will say well what did we get out of this this system we they took something away and that's all they'll go away with so just something I just wanted to bring up as to why we talk so much about that in our committee meeting. I'm glad you're doing that because that is true. It will. You're right. So as long as we give them at least what they have and something better. Right. Should be good. But the communication piece is huge. Yes. So there's no assumptions made and, and that kind yes. of thing. I, agree. I, I like that. Thank you. Thank <clears> you. <throat> Okay, we'll move on to other reports, information sharing. Open up to the board members. I'm always the one that share. I don't have much this time. Um, I did go over to uh, the CIO's office, showed me his network operating center. If you want to give a qu real quick, let me put you on the spot, but I was amazed by what he has created over there with uh, how they monitor for cyber. How, how many how many attacks a day? Let me see roughly. Oh, thanks. <laughs> no, it 
Okay, we, we don't have these in the Security Operations Center. Uh, no need for them, it's a small room, so. Um, so yeah, so we're seeing roughly uh, half a million cyber attacks a day that we're filtering through. Um, if you boil those down into things that are in, uh, actual investigations, those are roughly about 2,000 a year um, that we follow up on. Um, just a high level summary, we have, um, it's roughly uh, a 20 seat office, um, 14 screens, monitoring a variety of tools, cus both custom tools, uh, cybersecurity tools and, um, and commercial type tools. Uh, we're monitoring um, every state agency um, and cyber traffic going across the Iowa Communications Network. Um, uh, elected offices and other uh, branches can opt in as they wish. Uh, and then we're also monitoring, um, I think 90 of 99 counties um, and all the cybersecurity activity. So um, a, a big push recently with the uh, elections campaign, uh, the midterms uh, for heightened monitoring. Uh, and we expect that will um, increase significantly even in 2020. Um, nine, uh, the midterms was more responsive than the tools we put in uh, just for cyber threat and detection. Um, the tools we're putting in now are more preventative and, and, and hardening the networks uh, that they run. So um, it's a state of Iowa resource, as I tell people. And if you're interested in taking a tour, uh, it's paid for with your tax dollars. So come on down and see us anytime. Very nice. Yep. All right, I think we're on to uh, the project manager, Melvin. Is he here? There he is. Tom, I've got, I've got one quick question. Sure, uh, are we still staying on top of this wind turbine, wind turbine process? I know Chris has got so much on his plate. Is, is somebody kind of staying in tune with, with this process? Go ahead, Chris. Yes. Um, actually, it's funny you mentioned that. Your ears must have been itching when I was talking to MidAmerican earlier this week. Um, I spoke with one of their project engineers. Uh, his name's Matt Ott. And uh, they had asked us a question about um, one of their projects that they had ongoing and if that would uh, affect our network. Uh, so it seems like they, they understand and they recognize that, you know, hey, this is something that we need to kind of keep an eye on. Uh, one thing we had discussed with MidAmerican anyways, and I think if we could pull this off, it'd be a good practice to do with uh, the other entities that would be putting up wind uh, power turbines would be to have some sort of quarterly or, you know, semi-annually meeting so that, uh, you know, we could do it as a closed session so that, you know, if they needed to share some information that might not be public yet, they could on where they plan on doing projects and things like that. And then uh, there, there would be coordination from the start of the project to the end. Uh, one of the, the bills that, that, that would have sort of compelled uh, the companies to do communication studies by law uh, did not make it through session this year as far as I'm aware of. So uh, this is the next best thing we could do is, is that pre-planning and coordination with them. So uh, the initial thought process of having those routine meetings was very positive. So that'll be something that we look at doing uh, down the road, hopefully with more of them as well. Um, Iowa counties might be one of the ones that you've heard about. There's 70 of them going in. And I get to go there and keep the peace because these meetings can get pretty pretty heated um, in the rural areas. And one of the things I think it's going to be a challenge for, for radio is um, the fact that when they, they start these projects, they have a lot more sites determined that, that may not get used. So they go out and may, like in our case, they have 100 actual, or I'm sorry, 70 actual turbines, but they might have secured property uh, leases, potential leases, and maybe 120. And then as the project unfolds, they start to narrow the field down to those 70 actual sites. So a lot of moving targets there that I think we're going to have a challenge as we go forward. Now we're starting with 70 Powshe County. I don't know how many they have. They're going to get more. I mean, these things are going up fast. And um, it's kind of hard to say this is where a turbine is going to go. What they might say is here's three possible places a turbine might go, and we'll pick one of them. So just throwing that out there. I think the awareness is out. Uh, the idea would be give them our microwave shots and yep. please look at them before you. 
Yep, and, and anybody that has asked for those, I've been able to give them uh, that type of data. Uh, Melvin Mercado and Greg Van Hefty have been very, very good about getting us those those uh, GIS files so that we can share them with the uh, utility companies as they look at deploying those things. So that information is in a lot of the hands of, of, of the planning section for those respective agencies. And also thank you, Melvin and Greg, for getting that to us. That's been very helpful for all parties. Well, okay, here we go. All right, well, today I'm going to do something special and very different. Um, I have no presentations. I just got a little piece of paper here. Uh, but before I go into this, um, I think it's worth mentioning uh, with, with regards to the wind turbines and the wind farms. Um, by the time we're able to see them registered in the, beta, in the databases, it's almost too late, right? Um, as we learned, when we went through the whole process of building our towers, six months, right, six to a year and a half, these guys have probably been working on it for years. Uh, so by the time it shows up, they've already made a substantial investment, which is why uh, we can't wait until, or you shouldn't wait until that moment in time. It really has to happen way up front for those considerations to take place. Uh, the, uh, the approach of flooding the applications is, is normal because uh, the process is so complicated that you want to have options. Um, we, when we were building our towers, we tended to request FAA clearances for uh, heights that were not necessarily the heights that we were going to use, but we overdid it just in case something changed in the design that we had to use that reserve height in the application. So in some cases, we have a 350-foot tower, and we applied for 400, right, just in case we wanted that extra 50 feet or something like that. So. It's, it's normal and it's, it, is, it is part of, as things start moving forward, uh, then things start solidifying and then you end up with the final design. So when it comes to wind turbines, that's why it's important to have a process that's defined way, way up front, because uh, otherwise it becomes more difficult for them to make adjustments later on because they've already made all the investment in the process, right? Okay, feels weird not to have my animations here, but I just had really uh, just a few things because uh, you know we're coming pretty close to the end of the project, and uh, really not worth putting a PowerPoint presentation for that. Um, so there, there are two aspects uh, that remain for the construction. The first one is a completing of the hardened site. The hardened site itself is active; um, it's powered and it's operational. Uh, we just have to finish again fencing and landscaping and we're waiting for direction from the uh, city of Iowa Falls. So until we get that direction, we really can't complete that particular site. And then Rock Rapids, uh, we, have, uh, we have a design in place, an agreed design in place, and we have the drawings. So right now we're working on securing the resources to actually go and start doing the work. Those are the only two pieces when it comes to the actual construction of the system. Uh, when it comes to coverage testing, we are approved to continue coverage testing. So we're looking at, uh, uh, not next week, but the following week to start. So we're looking at starting, uh, restarting the coverage testing on 520 uh, so that we can go ahead and just cover the remaining counties that weren't tested before. Once we do that, we'll have lots of teams right scattered throughout the state and then we'll be able to provide updates then I'll provide a presentation with some pictures on it so you can see what that looks like. Uh, the upgrade of the dispatch centers continues. Again, this is not a, an ISIC specific, uh, the baseline system, but it's all the add-ons as well. So we got the ISIC ones up, done up front, uh, and then we're still continuing to work with all the add-on projects <clears throat> to update their consoles as well. Uh, we're working on the generator startups, and that's just an on ongoing process. And then what remains is really uh, ex executing the test plan. Uh, we've been working with the state, uh, going back and forth in different revisions. Uh, we provided the final revision now, which addresses all the concerns. Uh, so once we get the uh, final blessing on that, we'll start scheduling some time to do the actual functional testing, which is different than the coverage testing. And then the rest is, is documentation. All the, all the documentation on a per site basis and confirming that you know all that stuff is done. So we'll have some additional site walks with that and the documentation that supports all the work, all the studies, all the drawings, all the layouts, everything that's associated with our site. <clears throat> Any questions?
All right. Thank you. Thank you. I don't believe AT&T is here unless I'm not seeing them in the audience or on the phone. Is there AT&T on the phone today? Okay. Mr. Lundstedt. Good morning. Uh, Carol and uh, Chris have covered the current ICTAP Interoperable Communications Technical Assistance Program efforts. Update you on just a couple of things that are happening in the background related to ICS training. Uh, FEMA has announced that there are updates now available for the two in-person courses that we love to hate the most, ICS 300 and 400. As, as well as some changes to ICS 100, 200, 300, and 700. Those updates were as a result of the 2017 update to the National Incident Management System, NIMS. Uh, the only reason this is important to you is as we support state-sponsored classes where you have state instructors, uh, October 1, they will have had to have taken the bridge courses for ICS 300 and 400 and essentially recertified to be a state level instructor. Uh, long term, we are going to refashion our all hazards incident training courses for the instructors. The intent is to eventually do away with train the trainer for COMEL, train the trainer for COMT, train the trainer for tactical dispatch to get to a single train the trainer class that would cover all of these functional areas. That work starts after October 1, along with a refresh of the All Hazards Communications Unit Leader course, which uh, we will be undertaking through SAFECOM, the advisory board to ECD, and the Council of Statewide Interoperability Coordinators. Uh, perhaps of interest, we're going to hold a regional communications unit leader train the trainer class. Tentative plan is to hold that in Greater Kansas City, actually in Lee Summit, Missouri, in November timeframe. Uh, invitational travel will be extended to qualified individuals who want to become a COMEL instructor for the state. Uh, more to come, and it will be coordinated with the SWIC. The National, Inst National Emergency Communications Plan, which is our baseline document that governs how ECD supports state, local, tribal, and territorial activities. The NECP has been officially signed by SAFECOM and NICSWIC and now moves to the publication stage where it will be released by the Secretary of Homeland Security. Primary changes this year are to incorporate more focus on cybersecurity and some language refreshes such as talking about operational communications instead of operational communications, which gets confused with operations to communications capabilities, things like that, little tuning things. There will be a handful of measures that we use to help understand how effective those changes are. And we're actually working with the 56 states and territories on a markers program where we go through 25 baselines to assess where we are in the process. I, I did one of these with the state of Kansas yesterday, it took about an hour, very informative, and it kind of gives the SWIC a uh, checkerboard pattern that says this is an area that where focus may be needed, and we think that will be useful down the road. Uh, only other thing I have, and speaking to your CISO, this it shouldn't be news, and we had a situational alert this morning for a cyber attack, a cyber threat that's already been pretty painful the last couple of days called Robin Hood that was sent out to all the, the uh, carriers and ISPs this morning. <laughs> Robin Hood is a nasty variant of a ransomware that affected a major Mideastern city yesterday. And my reminder to you to take back to your agencies, how does this stuff get in our door? Typically email. We go for that hurried click on that document or the PDF or that link that we think is important and suddenly we find we have a problem. So uh, the, the old guidance about know your, know your uh, poison, know your, your steps, and if I have any advice for you right now about cyber, right now is a good time to be particularly aware with what we've been seeing with that particular variant this week, actually the last 10 days. Any questions for me? I'll comment on that. I 
had some emails that they're getting really smart with the oh, name. Oh yeah. It'll look like a name that you actually know. Mm -hmm. And then it just doesn't look right. But mm -hmm. it, I mean, but if you're clicking through emails, you, that's what they hope you'll do, right? I get a countless number of texts lately that are really crafty and well written because my name's been doxxed and I'm out in the public domain mm -hmm. and people would just love for me to click on that link. And you too, as your public servants, that's going to get worse and worse and worse. The, the most informed thing I can tell you is if you didn't ask for it, be very suspicious. Hey, yes, sir. If I may just add one thing, too. This is just a comment. Uh, I've seen actually websites where you can go to them and type in whose name you want to spoof, what their spoofable email address mm -hmm. is, and then type in whatever message you want. And it can just be standard text or it can include attachments or it can include active mm -hmm. links. There are websites that allow people to do that now, so any Joe Jack or Shirley can do that. It's for sale, just like number spoofing. That's that's the painful part, is you get to the point, or at least I do, that you look at the phone ringing and you go, nah, I'm not going to answer that. Well, it's it's a challenge for us, and it's just something <coughs> we're going to have to toughen up and figure out a way around. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, moving on to standards working group, like you're taking the care of that for us today. Yeah. Um, so the standards working group did not meet last month. Uh, there were some issues with scheduling and also uh, making sure that we had enough content available to cover. Uh, my uh, thought is that they'll probably meet again this month and we might start going over some standards that have already been passed to make sure that our thinking on them hasn't changed before things go live. Uh, there's also some other uh, types of standards and policies that would be beneficial to uh, get taken care of before the system goes live. So we will be meeting this month. Uh, that'll be in Adel in Dallas County. Uh, at the, uh, the building just north of town there off of Highway 169. So uh, expect a more thorough report from us next month. All right. All right, there's no old business. Let's move on to new business. Uh, back to you, Chair Buffington. All right, thank you. Uh, user group committee has reviewed and approved the, the six um, applicants, Adams County Level 2, ATF Level 2, City of Cedar Rapids Level 1, Mercy Ambulance uh, Des Moines updated their applicant participation plan Level 2, United States Capitol Police Level 2, um, United States uh, HHS Office of Inspector General Level 2, and that comes as a motion from the UGC to approve. We have a motion on the table for Adams County, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, Cedar Rapids, Mercy Ambulance, Des Moines, United States Capitol Police, United States Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Inspector General, Office of Investigations. Do I hear a second? Ness. Ness is a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. On to new ISIC standards approval governance. Back to Dave Ness. None this month. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are now on to the amended part with the extra funding for the uh, forum. Would you like to take that, Ellen? A motion or whatever you need. Motion. To I move that uh, we uh, amend the um, amount of money to be used for the forum to in include a raise of $5,000. Motion for, to amend the amount of the forum from previous to increase it by 5000 by Ellen. Do I have a second? Bischoff. Bischoff is a second. Any further discussion? I just want to emphasize that this is not uh, limited to Iowa. It is regional, and we benefit from the regional, and therefore there's some expense in attracting people to make it really uh, benefits us from having it here, but there's some additional cost that comes with that. Voted. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. Okay, we'll move on to public comment. If anybody would like to join the podium, you're going to address the board at this time. Curtis.
Good morning, Curtis Pion with the Polk County Sheriff's Office. Uh, I'll keep this brief too. So just wanted to say that we appreciate the work and the guidance of the users group committee. Uh, we've got 21 applications covering 28 agencies and roughly 1400 users that we're working through the process. So uh, we support the plan revisions uh, that Chair Buffington talked about. Um, having those specific items uh, that you need up front for the analysis, get that out there. So it's just so much simpler for everybody to go through the process, know what's required. So very supportive of that. And we'd encourage the board and the UGC to clarify the level one uh, applicants requirements for TDMA versus FDMA. Just make this thing as crystal clear as possible because we've been working for eight months with, with various folks to try and get these things through. And we got one more hurdle to get through. So uh, anything you can do to clean up that process, make it better for the next folks and uh, get us down the road, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Okay, motion for adjournment. So moved. Ellen? I'll second it. <laughs> Adjourn, thank you. Oh.